Um, so, uh, initial confession, I ended up playing a whole lot of Nintendo uh, lately. So the subtitle of my talk is What Zelda Taught Me About Front End Engineering. Um, all right. So uh, like Chris said, my name is Matt Steele. I'm Matt D. Steele on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, and I work at Union Pacific Railroad in Omaha, uh, doing mostly web, mostly mobile stuff. Um, so let's talk. So uh, my main contention today is that JavaScript, so just show of hands, who here does JavaScript at all at work? Almost everyone. Cool. Uh, it's fraught with peril. Everybody knows this, right? It's, it's a really hard language to, to work with. Um, there are anti-patterns everywhere you go. And the, the easiest place to find this is Stack Overflow. Uh, so this one uh, is a question that I think ended up getting deleted, but you know, it's, hey, I want to add a number to another number. How do I do this in JavaScript? And the, the correct answer says, hey, just use jQuery. It's really awesome. There's probably a plugin that does that for you. <laughs> right? And, and not even, I mean, maybe a little bit ironically, but you don't know, right? That's, that's the worst part is it's just, it's really hard. And you know, it's not just that um, everybody's kind of learning it on the job. It's that the, the language itself was, you know, it's a case of rushed implementation. Brendan and I did it in like four days or two hours or something on a Mountain Dew binge. Um, you know, Crockford's quote that the browser is the most hostile software engineering environment imaginable, I think is really true. And anyone that's had to work in Internet Explorer or has had to deal with, you know, quirky ECMAScript implementations, everybody knows this. I think since, like lately he said that, um, He's revising this to say that mobile is the most hostile environment imaginable, but it's still it's still just horrible. Um, so I started to think, well, what other environments are similar to this? Um, and then I started playing a bunch of Zelda One for the Nintendo Entertainment System. How many people have played Zelda One? Okay, most of you. So you know that that is a freaking hard game. It is just painful. Um, one of the things I didn't know about Zelda was that it was the first game to come with a battery backup um, so you could save your state. Uh, no other game before that came with it. And what they used it for was to save your state and not to save you know, a high score or um, anything else. It, it was simply all you could see was how many hearts you had and how many times you had died in the game. Right? That, was, that was the way that you could see it. Every time that I played this game, like, I just imagine that the world is littered with corpses of links from the past, just everywhere. It's, oh, it's so hard. It's really bad. Um, so Tevis Thompson wrote an article about uh, playing Zelda, where he actually laments this. Um, and I thought there were some good quotes here. It's famous difficulty demanded so much, not just from my hands, but from my entire ragged nervous system, my temper, my character. It never explained itself and so conjured a community as helpful and treacherous as any group of humans. This kind of sounds like doing JavaScript, right? <laughs> At least to me it did, right? You, you get a really active community of people trying to help you, but a lot of people don't have any clue what they're doing or they're just trolling you or they're copying and pasting code and never learn to, to write JavaScript. Like, I think there's a lot of analogies here, or at least this is why, this is how I'm trying to uh, excuse my procrastination for not working on this talk in the past. Right, so here's, here's one of the old men in the game. Secret is in the tree at the dead end. I have no idea what the hell this means. Um, it's, it's, you realize how many dead ends there are in this game, how many trees there are, and, and then, and so you have either like bombs or you have flashlights. Um, and the flashlights only work once per screen, so if you don't get the right tree, then you have to go back out of the screen and then go back in. Uh, it's just really painful. Um, and every time that I tried to, so I started off the game uh, playing it, saying I'm not going to, like I'm just going to run with it. I'm going to pretend like I've never, like I don't have the internet at my side. I'm not going to ask anybody for help who's ever played this game. I'm just going to run through it, and I just died over and over and over again. Right, my death count is in the hundreds right now when I save it. It's just really, really bad. Um, 
So eventually, I got to a point where I couldn't progress any farther. Um, it was it just wasn't working for me anymore. So I had to find a better system. So um, the game itself is old enough that there's just plenty of guides and tutorials. Um, this one is on like ZeldaQuest.net. It has every game. Um, and one of the things that I realized was not only um, can you acquire all the weapons and equipment um, in a non-linear order, like this is one of the big differences between Zelda 1 and other Zelda games, but you don't even have to go into any of the dungeons, right? You can get the best sword in the game. You can have all of the heart containers minus like three um, before you get to the first level. You can, you can half the damage that you take. And as soon as you start taking that approach and following a step-by-step -step guide, the game becomes not easy, but at least manageable, right? I'm, I'm still playing it. I'm on like the seventh dungeon. Actually, I'm on the fifth dungeon because the last time I played, I couldn't figure out how to save the game, so I lost two hours and two dungeons worth of work. Um, it was really bad. But, but having a system in place means that you can at least um, progress forward. So, uh, unfortunately, there is no Prima's unauthorized guide to JavaScript the same way that like these unauthorized guys are everywhere, and I'm pretty sure there's one for Zelda, right? There's, there's no one guidebook that we can look at that'll tell us how to treat JavaScript like a real language. So it's kind of up to us, and so that's what I'm gonna try and talk to you guys about. So my main crux is, in order to win at the game of JavaScript, we have to treat it like a real language. Um, and this means that we have to do a couple of things that we do in other real languages. For example, we have to actually learn the language, learn its implementation. I know, it's crazy. Uh, you have to use the appropriate tooling for the job. Uh, you have to do unit testing. And you have to use the appropriate build tools. And I had to put this slide in because everybody knows it. And we, we got a dude who has it on his shirt here today. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. All right. So the first thing that we have to do is to actually learn the language. Um, how many people here had a class at school where the core focus was learning the JavaScript language? Zero people. OK, so we have a 0% rate. And, and that really shows in the market. Right? Another one of Crockford's quotes is that JavaScript is the only language that people feel they don't need to learn before they start using it. Right? We're, we're all on the job trainees. Um, you know, you start off building a website and then you, you realize, I need to do something with it. So you learn just enough JavaScript to make that piece work. Um, and that's really hard. So this is the other joke, right, is the definitive guide to JavaScript and then you take a look at the size of that compared to JavaScript, the good parts. Um, and, and you realize that you're just running into a, into a minefield um, trying to learn it this way, that if you, if you don't have the appropriate kind of guidance telling you which parts of the language are useful to learn, um, you know, why you shouldn't be doing uh, like new array instead of using the object literal syntax. Like all that stuff, you, you need people to, to show you the way. And, and a lot of times that doesn't happen. Like that didn't happen for me and I'm still kind of learning it. Um, so the, the resources that I really like are uh, JavaScript, the good parts, uh, Stoyan Stefanov, has a book on JavaScript patterns that I found that are really useful. Um, so Rebecca Murphy uh, put together uh, a GitHub repository called JS Assessment, um, and it's a really cool resource. It's very similar to like Ruby cones um, or other test-driven based tools. And what you do is you clone this repository, and it starts up a web server, and it has a whole bunch of failing tests. And your job is to go into the source code for this project and make those tests pass. So the first one is something like, you know, use parse incorrectly and use the, the radix parameter, um, or don't define global variables. And as you're making changes, you refresh and you can see how it goes, uh, how, how much progress you're making. And a lot of these are really hard. Uh, Paul Irish also has a really good set of uh, Google Reader bundles for people that are doing work in the world of front-end development. I think there's actually a couple of people here that this subscribes to, which is kind of cool. Um, but he, he tries to curate it, and he has a whole bunch of sub-bundles. So if you're doing a bunch of web app development, and you're using tools like Ember and Spine, 
then you can read those. If you're just doing standards development, you want to see what the W3C is up to, you can read those. Um, and they constantly get curated and updated, um, although it's really verbose. But it at least is some way to uh, kind of keep up to date um, instead of like just these books that are around. Uh, does anyone else have like books or resources that they really like to use to just learn the basics of the language? Yeah, MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network. Um, they're partnering with a whole bunch of other companies to make, I think it's webstandards.org, um, which is supposed to be a definitive resource for a lot of the you know, browser quirks, implementation, stuff like that. And MDN is contributing a lot of content to make that work. Um, one approach that I really like is to do what's called a code kata. How many people have heard of this thing before? Okay, so if, uh, about a third of you. Um, so code kata, it, it um, references a, a martial arts kata, which is just a series of pre-planned and orchestrated moves um, that are designed to help you master a particular uh, discipline or um, exercise. So in the world of coding, a kata can be done to teach you a number of things. And the way that it works is you come up with a problem um, and you solve it. And then you delete your code and then you solve the problem again. So it isn't trying to actually master the situation, or it's not trying to solve the problem, like you know how to do that. Um, but instead, maybe the question is, how do I uh, find the prime factors of a number? Instead, the, the task is to try and master that um, as effective, effectively as possible. So for example, one of the things that I always mess up when I'm doing JavaScript is when to use call versus apply when I'm trying to invoke a function. Um, I still don't remember which one takes a raise. So uh, what I started to do was put together just a kata where I would have to um, pass in a function and I would need to change what the this variable is and doing that with call versus apply. So I've only done it a couple of times um, and I'm still learning it, but eventually I'll, I'll actually understand what's going on and then I can be done with the kata. So um, I think that's one way of kind of learning where you're weak uh, in terms of the language and then making that better. And uh, there's an octocad. I kind of like that. All right, uh, tooling. So here's how I originally uh, wrote my JavaScript in Notepad. And I was proud of it. Oh, I was so proud. Um, this was handcrafted. In fact, when, so when I was growing up, um, I was in Boy Scouts, and uh, there was a troop webmaster position that was open, and people had to vote on who was going to be the webmaster. And it was me and this one other guy, and this other guy was just kind of a jerk. You know, he used the WYSIWYG editor, and it was just hosted on GeoCities, and it was just awful. And so my pitch to, you know, all of my peers was, Hey guys, I write my web pages in Notepad. I write it all by hand. Look at how awesome I am. And that other guy got the uh, position. <laughs> um, but this is where a lot of people come from, right? This is this is the the more pure way to write your code, um, right? You don't you're you're not relying on a tool, and you just feel closer to the code. You're at the metal, right? At least that's that's how I was, and I think that's how a lot of people originally wrote their JavaScript. Um, can anybody find the syntax error in this, by the way? It's kind of hard to see. No, I'm closing the UL. Yep, I'm not closing my UL. <laughs> so Rand had this quote that I really liked. Um, it says, as an engineer, there's a short list of tools that you must be rabid about. Foaming at the mouth crazy, right? Anybody that's gotten into a Vim versus Emacs debate can understand what I'm talking about or tabs versus spaces or whatever. That's not a tool. It's just the people that argue that are tools. But, um, but, but you need to have some of these tools, right? Because in the same way that um, you know, somebody that runs 26.2 miles is a hero, and somebody that goes that the same distance on a bicycle is just going on an after, like a nice you know, jaunt. It just makes your work so much easier. And, and you have to be curating your tools. So the, the big one that I have is just to learn your editor. And it doesn't matter what it is. Um, you know, it could be Notepad++, or probably not Notepad. I don't think anyone is using that anymore. 
But you know, learn the learn the keyboard shortcuts, learn the macros, figure out what plugins are available, um, and you'll just become that much more effective, right? The 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 folks that I see that have like four different editors open, you know, they have Eclipse and they have WebStorm and they have Visual Studio and they have Sublime Text open. Like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like you should try and master one. Um, and I'm I'm struggling with that myself, but I think that's that's one of the ways that you can get really good. Um, and your tool should always be fighting for their lives, right? When you start with Zelda, you get this like crappy little wooden sword that can barely take down anything. It takes 15 hits to kill any monsters, and you keep dying in the process. But eventually, you get enough heart containers, you can get a master sword, and eventually that isn't good enough, right? And the same is true of our tools. Eventually, the stuff that we have that we think that works really well um, just doesn't cut it. Like, I, I can't code in Notepad++ anymore. Um, it just doesn't have the tools that I need. So uh, one of the ones that I've really liked lately is this tool called Zen Coding. Um, so Zen Coding is a plugin that's now called Enid, I think. And the way that it works is you write your markup in the form of a CSS selector, and then you press a couple of keys, and boom, it just writes all your markup for you. So this is, this is crazy awesome. Um, and for me, this is the, like, I've never been able to get Haml or any of the other Java or the HTML templating engines. Like, that didn't ever click for me. But this part does. Um, and so I was really excited when I could find out that there was a Vim plugin for it. Um, and I think there's one for Sublime Text and a whole bunch of other platforms as well. Um, so this is my latest one that I really like. But, you know, a year from now, who knows what it's going to be. Um, so you should also have some kind of style guide, and I think that your tools can help enforce that. Uh, Rebecca Murphy uh, works at Boku. She said that arguments over style are pointless, but you should have a style guide and you should follow it. Right? So, so I don't care whether you indent your code with tabs or spaces, but, when you, but you should choose one as a team, and when you commit code, your tools should help you enforce that. Right? If, you can, if your editor can show you that you added in some hard tabs in a file that has only spaces, then you should know about that, and you shouldn't find out only after you after you check in your code. Um, how many people are have the use strict flag on when they're writing JavaScript? Okay, so just a handful of folks. Um, so this is something that I've just started to learn about and, and played around with. So use script use strict I think is new in ECMAScript five. Um, it is essentially a subset of the language, um, and it removes a lot of the bad practices that JavaScript initially started off with. So for example, if you forget to put the var keyword in front of a variable, by default JavaScript makes it global. If you have use strict enabled and all you have to do to enable it is at the top of a function, put that string in. Um, if you forget to declare the var, put in that keyword, it'll actually give you an error. Um, so not every browser has this, although I think that every mod, like the latest version of every browser, including IE 10, has it available. Um, and then a bunch of server-side, like Node, and I think Rhino have it available as well. Semicolons. So you should choose. Like, You should figure out if semicolons are, are good or bad, and whether or not you can rely on automatic semicolon insertion. Right? I, you shouldn't be prescriptive about it, but your tools should help enforce that. Um, is anybody linting or hinting their code? Okay, so a handful of folks. Um, so JavaScript is a dynamic language. It doesn't have any um, uh, type checking on it. You know, you find out about syntax errors when you load your code up and then you refresh. Um, so there are two tools that can make this a little bit easier. Uh, one is JS lint, and then there's a fork of that called JS hint, um, which uh, I think is your code's first unit test. So it can detect whether you have put in, you know, one equal sign when in your if statement instead of two or three like you should have. It can figure out if, um, you know, uh, if you've forgotten to put in this keyword. Uh, there's just a ton of checks that it can do where it'll tell you whether your code is syntactically correct, if it's matching the rules that you've defined. Um, you know, you can tell it never to allow eval when you're writing your code. And you, know, and you can configure a lot of those pieces. So um, yeah, definitely take a look at JS Hint. Um, and then the, the next level is getting that integrated with your IDE. 
So I'm using a Vim plugin called Syntastic here. Um, and the way that it works is I write my code and every time that I save, it will lint my code. And um, if there's any errors, it gives me a little arrow uh, in the gutter. So in this case, and then you can see what the error is at the bottom. So every time I'm saving, I'm able to tell whether or not I have syntax errors in my code. In this case, JS Hint is telling me that I need to have the uh, what base I'm doing parse int in, uh, which is something that, yeah, that second parameter in parse int, you have to put it in or else you can get weird octal uh, strangeness at the end of it. Um, so another tool that you can use is if you're using git, um, you can set up a pre-commit hook um, that says every time I check in my code, if there's a JavaScript file, um, run JS hint on it. And if there's any errors, don't let me check in that code. Um, so Nick Nisi wrote this, and uh, it's awesome. And it's a way of protecting yourself from yourself or from your teammates that don't have the syntax and JS hint stuff uh, set up initially. So there's a ton of tools that you can have that's going to make your life a whole lot easier, right? You don't you don't have to um, make changes, save, deploy it out to your dev browser, and then realize that you forgot to close your parameters. Um, like that's that's an inefficient way of working, and a lot of these tools are just starting to come about. Matt, can you have global pre-commit hooks, or do you have like per project? Has to be per project, and you can't. It doesn't check in with the project, so I had to write a script that I just tell everyone on the team to run, and then it just sim links into the .git slash hooks. Yeah. Uh, so the other the other uh, thing that I really like to do is just to watch other people. Like sit down, not trying to solve any particular problem, but just see how they work. And you can gleam a ton of information that way. Um, a couple of months ago, I sat down with Nick just for uh, a beer and code session and learned so much about Vim, about JavaScript, about RequireJS. It just blew my mind. Um, and there's actually a couple of screencasts that are really good. Peep Code has a few that are definitely worth checking out. Um, just finding out how people use their tools, you know, what Vim plugins they or Emacs, I guess, uh, plugins are available. Like it, seeing how other people work, I think it's really um, inspiring, and it's a really good way of leveling up. And you, you don't like you can pick and choose the things that are useful to you. So if you realize that you uh, differ philosophically on some some aspect, like you watching somebody that indents their code with tabs. I'm not going to start doing that. That's just crazy talk. Uh, but if if they have a really good um, like window manager for OS X, I'll definitely take that part out. All right, testing. How many people are testing their code in JavaScript right now? Just a handful of folks. Okay, and that that also is kind of reflected in in the market. Uh, I don't actually have a reason for this up here. I just it's it's the <laughs> meme that goes along with Zelda. All right, so here's how most people test their JavaScript code, is you make some changes, and then you alt-tab over to your browser, and then you refresh, and you see, is it working? All right, my unit tests pass. Um, so that is a really uh, archaic way of writing your test, and it just doesn't scale well, right? Eventually, you're gonna get to a point where, um, in order to effectively test your code, not only are you gonna have to refresh, but you're gonna have to go through a workflow, right? You're gonna have to click a, a few buttons, um, or you'll have to refresh over to a bunch of different browsers, um, and eventually you won't have a front end, right? If you're doing clients or if you're doing server-side JavaScript, this isn't even available to you anymore. So this process of just refreshing and seeing if stuff mostly works, that's we have better tools that are available to us now. Um, so I wanted to see just how many people were actually doing testing. So what I did was I went out to GitHub and I said. Find me every user that says they're located in Lincoln, Nebraska. And then find me all of the repositories. And then I checked each one out onto my laptop, and it took forever. Um, and then I just did a search, and I said, see if you can find a file, any file in the repository that contains the word test. If that exists, then that project is tested. If it doesn't exist, then that project isn't tested. Um, and so here's, here's the stats for Lincoln. Um, and you can, as you can see, JavaScript is, has the most number of uh, projects, but it's also one of the worst in terms of, uh, of code that's under test. And this is probably actually over-exaggerating it, right? You can probably have a test 
a dot test JavaScript file that isn't actually doing any type of unit testing. Um, like PHP is beating us, which is just crazy. Uh, and Omaha is not any better, right? Here's here's how it looks here, um, and you know PHP is back in the in the bottom, um, but but you know for the most part, more often than not, if you take a random repository that's JavaScript in GitHub, it's not going to have any tests on it. Um, which is a shame because there's a lot of really good tools that have started to become available. So there's a ton of uh, testing frameworks out there. There's QUnit, Mocha, JS Test Driver. Um, the one that I use is just called Jasmine. Um, I really like it because it's got, um, it runs in the browser and the test runner itself is really nice. So you can just pull up a, uh, you can pull up a browser window and you can have all of your unit tests run. And if you start to use tools um, that will auto refresh the page for you, um, then you don't even have, like you can just leave that open in another window and just watch as your code changes. Um, and you can have hundreds of tests run in a matter of a few seconds. Uh, the other thing that I really like about uh, Jasmine is you can execute the test on the command line. So I'm using a tool called Grunt um, to run my Jasmine test, and here it ran all seven of those tests in. Uh, 30 milliseconds, uh, and it's using a real browser, uh, a headless web kit called PhantomJS, uh, to do that. And you have access to the full API. So you get the DOM, you get cookies, local storage, all the other pieces that you would expect from a modern browser. So, so my workflow is now, I don't open up the page that I'm working on, right? If I'm trying to write a library, I can think agnostic from the DOM, I can think agnostic from the actual windows that I'm working with. And instead, think about what I'm trying to accomplish. And for me, that's helped me to write a much cleaner kind of API than if I was just had a page open and I was trying to hack on it. Um, so definitely, tr like, it doesn't matter what tool you use, but just try one. Um, there's a couple of other tools that I really like. One um, that gives you access to mocking. So the ability to test your AJAX code without actually calling a server. Um, this also, uh, and this is sign in. JS. It also lets you get access to um, things like changing the timer. So um, if you're testing your set timeouts, um, you can actually stop time and tick through it a millisecond at a time, which is just crazy to look at, um, and it's a really good way of testing your asynchronous code. Uh, and then this I just thought was amazing. This is a this is a plugin for Jasmine that lets you take two images and it does a diff against them. So in this case, it compares the left to the middle piece, and then it gives you a visual diff of what of the any differences between them. So in this case, you can see a little monocle that's missing on the far left uh, uh, octocad. Um, so I have no idea how this actually works. Um, I think it's a canvas type of check, but if you're if you're doing things where you're actually building um, uh, images using canvas or other tools. Like you can actually test it and get visual diffs in your unit tests that tell you whether or not it's working or not. And actually when Google was building Chrome, they used a technique very similar to this so that their rendering engine would pass all of the ACID3 specifications. Um, so this has a lot of really cool uses. Uh, so the last piece that I have is to use a build tool. Um, so one of the really cool things about JavaScript is that you don't have to use a build tool. Right, you can just get like you can FTP onto a production server. You can start hacking away at JavaScript, save, and it becomes available. Um, like that—that that was my workflow. How many? Like that's a lot of people's workflow. Um, but you end up missing out on a lot of really good tools um, or things that you would want to do. So the the main one is running your tests. You know, tell, seeing whether or not with a single command whether your entire application functions the way that it should according to the specification that you've set. Um, but you can do a lot of other things that, that you would want to automate. You know, have your linter uh, run. Any type of concatenation, minification, you know, running closure compiler or Uglify JS. Um, compiling your code, right? If you're using something that compiles down to JavaScript, you need to do that in an automated way. Um, if you want to remove console.log, precompile your, uh, your uh, templates, like any of those pieces, you want to be able to define once and be done with it. And that's what a build tool will help you do. 
So there's a ton of build tools out there as well. Um, the one that I like, uh, that I started to use for my JavaScript projects is Grunt. Um, it's written by Ben Allman, um, and he uh, he wrote it in Node, so you get access to a lot of the uh, the Node um, libraries like uh, Uglify.js and JS Hand just out of the box. Um, it's really new. I think I don't even think they're at 1.0 yet, uh, but it has a lot of um, it's moving really fast. But you know, Ant, Make, whatever they they all work kind of the, the way that you would want. Uh, and then once you have that, you can do a ton of other stuff. Like there's a CSS linter that you, you can hook up into your build tools. So you can figure out if you're applying the best practices to your uh, to other parts. Compressing images, like that's the, that's the biggest hit in terms of performance, is huge image files. Um, auto watching, so this is something that if you save your file, it will automatically you know, recompile your templates, reload your browser, um, you know, creating documentation, downloading dependencies. You can automate all this. You don't have to do any of this work anymore. Like people have solved these problems for us. Um, one of the other tools that's built on top of Grunt is a tool called Yeoman. Um, it's worked on by like Adi Asmani and Paul Irish and a few other people. Again, it's super new. They just came out of like they had an alpha release a month or two ago. Um, but they get access to a whole bunch of just boilerplate out of the box. Um, so this is another tool that's really kind of cool and is, is growing in popularity. And then once you have all those pieces set up, you can configure your JavaScript jobs to run automatically on a continuous integration server. So uh, if you haven't used a CI server before, that lets you check in your code, and then a machine, some server somewhere, will check out the new build and run your automation for you. So it'll run all of your unit tests, um, and if it fails, it can email the whole team, right? So we've all been in that situation where somebody has made a change, checked it in, and then it broke the build for everybody else. And, or maybe that guy left for the day, and then you have to you know, wait until tomorrow, um, or you know, they left for vacation. Like you don't have, that, that's a solved problem. You can get that emailed automatically. And then you can set up your CI to do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? You can, you can configure it so that any time that the build passes, it pushes your code to production, right? That's, but, but you have this, the confidence that when you've made your change, that all of your tests have passed, like you, you know that the code is good. You know, if you, can, if you can write tests that make you trust your code, then CI server can do all of that just grunt work of uh, FTPing files up and do all that automatically for you. So uh, that's what automation and build tools can get you. Like that's the holy grail. Um, so the pizza's here, so I won't keep us any farther. Um, so my, my, I guess my point is, if you if you apply these types of practices to whatever type of JavaScript you're working on, you know whether it's part of a .NET application, if you're doing it just pure single page app, or if you're writing backend uh, Node.js stuff, like you can become the hero of Hyrule. Uh, and then the last part that you get is um, one thing: if you beat J uh, Zelda One, there's a second quest. There's an entire second game in that. Um, that has totally different monsters, has totally different, uh, uh, you know, enemies. The dungeons are, are way different, um, and there's an analogous to that, and that is coffee script. <laughs> but that's for another talk. That's it. Thanks, guys. Thank